All right. Uh, well, thanks again, Judd, for, for joining us. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm sure I see many familiar names and, and faces here, so it's not all of your first AMA with Rally, uh, but for those that are new, uh, this is uh, an hour here uh, where we're going to spend uh, the first five, ten minutes uh, just hearing live from Judd more about who he is and some of his thoughts uh, in the world of research and uh, the rest of the time is going to be spent on on you uh, what questions that you have for for Judd uh, and definitely feel free to drop things into the chat uh, we appreciate all the questions that were submitted in advance uh, we'll prioritize the chat questions and then go back to the survey questions uh, if if necessary uh, but definitely leverage the real-time opportunity to, to meet with him uh, and for those of you that I have not yet met, I am Oren, um, one of the co-founders and CEO here at Rally. Uh, we are not just an AMA company. Uh, we also have built a user research CRM uh, that makes it easy for teams to scale up research operations, automate a lot of the manual work around recruiting and managing their own participants for research. Uh, we won't get into much detail about Rally today, but if you are ever curious or want to learn more, uh, we'll drop our website and uh, link to a demo in the chat. You can always reach out to me directly. Uh, but without further ado, uh, I am very, very excited uh, to welcome Judd Anton today to Rally AMA. Uh, if you have not yet come across Judd on Lenny's podcast uh, or his writing on Medium, then you are definitely missing out. Uh, but luckily for you, we have a full hour of Judd to ourselves right now. Uh, so a little bit of background on Judd, and I can go on and on about this, but I'll try to be quick. Uh, he has spent the last 15 years building research, product, and design teams at Facebook and Airbnb. Uh, he is also a self-proclaimed battle-tested dumpster firefighter. So I'm sure he'll talk a little bit about this, but Judd does not shy away from chaos. He thrives uh, in helping teams navigate crises and solve their trickiest problems. And why is Judd here today? Uh, he is here with us to paint the picture of a bright future, uh, which I know we all need these days, uh, where, where UX research is core to an organization's innovation and success. Uh, he has a really exciting vision uh, that he's going to share and that we'll get more deep into, uh, which calls for systemic change, uh, empowering researchers with diverse methodologies and closer cross-functional collaboration uh, to really drive meaningful impact. Uh, so without further ado, floor is yours uh, for your intro, Judd. Awesome. Thank you, Oren. Um, I'm going to go ahead and assume you can hear me until I hear otherwise. I apologize to anybody who uh, is offended by my technical difficulties. Hopefully there won't be any, but um, so thanks to all of you for being here. I see lots of friends and colleagues here and I appreciate you spending the time and, and thanks to Oren and Lauren and Rally. I'm, I'm just like hopeful that I have something useful to say um, and, and I wanna appreciate so many conversations that I've been able to have with this crazy and wonderful community of humans over the last, well, my entire career, but certainly since last summer when I wrote a post uh, that Oren referenced um, and did, did it because I was thinking about the evolution of the field, um, not for really any other reason. And, and um, it ended up a, a little bit um, in, in, I like to say in the most niche possible way that one can go viral. Like I have, I have gone total niche viral. Um, but um, so I, I call I use the phrase the research reckoning, and I have some some uh, mixed feelings about that because now I'm the reckoning guy, and I'm not sure about that. And 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 I actually I think maybe it's the wrong word because it feels serious and and scary. But actually, um, I I don't want to create anxiety. I actually feel very positive about the future. Um, but but I made an argument in that post, and I just want to share a few quick thoughts, like Oren said, and then spend most of the time on on questions. But I, I'm, I was making the argument that that it might be a good time to take stock of our research practice over the last 10 or 15 years and see what we could learn and think maybe there are some ways we need to pivot and evolve um, for the for the next 15. And, and I, in that article, I focused on on two things. I won't repeat it. But one is just the belief that I have that in many situations we're doing the wrong research. Um, in, we, we end up doing too much of this sort of blunt mid-level 
uh, question asking um, during product development, questions like how do users think and feel about something or, or what are concerns or challenges with why? And those are all reasonable questions that we've been trained and taught or what we're supposed to be doing, but they, they just aren't pointed enough for us to have enough business impact. And, and so I, I, I argue, I'm arguing that we should probably focus on a different set of questions. Number one, on the sort of low level, micro level questions, usability and the whole other range of technical work that we can do to make products better. Um, a lot of researchers think that's beneath them, that that's work that interns and, and junior researchers should do. And I think that's bullshit. I think it drives a huge amount of business value. Um, and, and if you want to talk about measurable ROI for research, like you should definitely start there. I've seen it turn, um, you know, how easy it is to, to demonstrate the impact of research through that type of work. But then you also earn social capital through that impact on the business that you can use to focus on the higher level strategic questions. And by strategic, I mean questions that set, help set the roadmap for next quarter, next year, next whatever, next five years, right? So deeply involved in planning processes. You People use strategic to mean a lot of different things. In fact, I think you're gonna get a link to a poll that I have going. I would love to know what you mean when you say strategic research. I'm gonna analyze all the responses and write a post about it because I have a feeling we don't all mean the same thing, even though a lot of people confidently say like, oh, strategic research, it has this clear definition. Doesn't everybody know it? And I'm like, okay, I don't, sure, but I don't think everybody agrees with you on that one. Um, so I think we need to focus on different questions. We're being asked to do those things, but we can be a part, we can be change agents in the, in, in the fact that we can be asked to do different things. And the other part is I think we need to focus on being capitalists and, and really on the business uh, and driving business impact with research. I was surprised at how much pushback there has been on that. Um, and I feel like for a lot of research, um, for a lot of researchers, like capitalism is like the boogeyman. Um, and, and I think, um, but the boogeyman is like the worst forms of capitalism. Like they're, you know, like fine. And I think we should avoid the most extractive forms of capitalism, but that doesn't mean that we can't be people who are intimately tied to business success. That is how we get more uh, power, more influence, more jobs in industries that pay our salaries. And, and so I think there's a shift there. Um, I think we should have um, a different conversation, right? And so today, today's title is Future Proofing Your Research Practice. Here are a few things I, I hope we talk more about in the context of the questions that come up. Um, the, the first one, I really hope we, we talk about how important it is to learn the language of the business and integrate it deeply into our research practice and to do that with joy and not shame, right? Like, oh God, we're stooping low now that we know how to read the PL and the shareholder reports. And like we're, we've deeply integrated knowledge of how uh, conversion funnels work and used it really specifically to motivate pointed, pointed research questions. It's still in the middle range maybe, but super pointed based on knowing the business. I think we need to become multi-method, even this is not a new idea, but I think to future-proof our research practices, we have to acknowledge the primarily qualitative model of UX research might not be as common or successful as it has been in the past. I think every researcher benefits themselves by understanding additional, uh, like maybe not as deeply, but being T-shaped certainly and understanding survey design, basic statistics, um, interacting with data, AI tools. I hope we, I'm sure we'll talk about AI tools. Um, I'll give it away. I don't think it's taking anybody to jobs. I think AI tools are going to make us more efficient and powerful as a group if we learn how to work with them effectively. Um, I think we need to focus on different questions. I think we need to turn our practice inward and use our research skills to um, develop relationships and influence. I taught a whole course about that at UC Berkeley in the fall. Um, and the thesis of it is research, leadership is a research practice, right? That if you look at the literature about management and research, you find out a lot of it, a lot of the things that great leaders do are things researchers are well equipped to do. So let's do them. And then last but not least, like Oren said, be a part of creating this structural change where we create end to end engagement uh, between researchers and the rest of the product team. So that's, I think the ultimate moment of success is when from end to end, from beginning to end, researchers are so deeply embedded that they just can't have the meeting without you. And I think that we, you may think, well, I don't get to decide what the product process is. And I hear you, except that if we as an industry 
put ourselves in a position of demonstrating why that model is so valuable and building skills so that when we are in those rooms, not just influencing, but making decisions, we're just so obviously adding value that it becomes easier to do it that right way and harder to do it the wrong way. So those are a few hopefully provocative thoughts. Um, I'll just stop there. And I want to I want to thank you again for being here. Uh, I've again like learned so much from you, and and I like I want to I want to just have one final thought, but which maybe we could end with too. But like so, when I left Airbnb, I I made this website, which I hope you look at. Um, it's no one has any idea dot com, hmm. and it's a mantra that I say to myself on a regular basis, kind of to combat imposter syndrome, but also to remind myself that the humble learner vibe is the most important thing for me, because everybody around us, especially in tech, like kind of pretends that they know they're know what they're doing, that they, they've got their shit together. Like there's some secret handshake that we don't know. And they don't, we don't, no one knows, no one knows what they're doing. I firmly believe that. I heard a podcast with Barack Obama recently where he said the same thing. I was like, yes, President Obama, no one has any idea. And if that's yeah. true, we all just hang out and learn from each other. And, 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 um, and so thanks for being engaged with that. Amazing. Thank you for that intro, Judd. Wholeheartedly agree. Subscribe to that. Nobody has any idea what they're doing. We're all just here. All we have is each other to figure figure things out. So uh, yeah. might as well, yeah, might as well lean on that. Wonderful. Well, you touched on a lot of different topics and uh, selfishly, I have a ton of questions, but I want to go straight to the Q&A and make this AMA as interactive as possible. So uh, for those that haven't submitted questions yet or aren't familiar with uh, the Q&A, just it's a third tab to the top. Uh, you can add your question and then others can upvote and we'll just go by upvoting order. So first question here is submitted by Kathy. Uh, what if your organization is primarily focused on driving short-term shareholder value versus lasting business impact? Uh, how should research show up and push back to increase its impact? Great question, Kathy. I think in this, my understanding of this economic moment is many, many businesses are in a short term mode, just trying to weather the storm, if you are, if you will. I think in that environment, <clears throat> focusing, well, okay, two things. Number one, um, I don't think that we, I think we need to be focused on, part of being business first is being focused on the priorities that the business is focused on, not just trying to convince them they're focused on the wrong priorities. So honestly, if the question is like, how do we demonstrate value in that environment? I, I think my answer is kind of the same as in any other environment, which is um, start by understanding um, your organization's top priorities. What is the most important business priority, product design priority in that moment? Work on that. If you think it's not the most important thing, I sort of don't care. Um, because working on the thing that the rest of your organization thinks is important is a key way that we demonstrate business value. However, like if it's a short term thing and you find yourself doing um, more, let's say, micro level research, one thing that I found about, let's say, the average usability test is that I I think I can all go on a limb and say every single time a usability test can also glean useful mid and long term insights when you do a few of them and you are looking for those things. Because yes, we get feedback on the pixels and, and the UX and stuff, but in the context of a user study, and you know, just a simple think aloud thing, you know, whatever, users are fascinating. People are fascinating, they say stuff. And so even when the company is focused on the short term, I think synthesizing the things you learn and then, and then, and then creating a framework to understand the potential for future value, even if the company's focused on the short term, is a great thing to do. But use the language that the business is already using to define their priorities. Don't try to say, focus on this, not that. Say, you said we're focusing on this, and we are in the short term. But if we want to do that in the long term, I got some good stuff for you there, too. And I, I maybe I got it from usability tests. That's great. We can do that, too. Awesome. Awesome. So obviously this, this concept of uh, learning the language of the business is, is coming up and uh, it's something that you feel very strongly about. So maybe uh, give us a one or two minute high level overview of how, how can someone get started on this? How, how can they uh, learn the language of the business to effectively yeah, make an impact? Yeah. 
I think you have to learn by doing. So if you're if you're involved or interested in a, you don't even have to work for a company. But if you work for a public company, definitely find the last quarterly report, the, the last shareholder letter. Letter. Um, look at the presentation. Listen to the call. Um, and and in, when you do that, a, a lot of researchers find out there's a lot of lingo, just language that they haven't really encountered before. It's finance. It's but also it's it's how the, the company and how the executives are talking about users and opportunities and the funnel. Like, I think you really, when you, when you do that, and by the way, if you don't work at a public company, you can still find a lot of those documents. So scour your internal drives and look for goals, like the last uh, business update, make sure you understand all the, the, the reports. Uh, and in particular, like how, um, <clears throat> how does your company make money? Um, like what, um, where does, where does revenue come from? What does it cost to generate that revenue? Um, what are the biggest drivers of change, positive or negative in the bottom line? Understand the difference between the top line and the bottom line, you know, like all those things. So I think the, the best first suggestion I have is to listen or watch or find those moments where you are uncomfortable and realize it's like, I'm just going to start listening to a new, to a, to YouTube content in French. <laughs> you know, and at first you're going to be like, oh, crap. But um, pretty soon you'll realize it's not like, sure, you're, you may not be getting a job as a CFO anytime soon, but it's not all that complicated. And we're researchers. We understand different ways of, of, of knowing about the world all the time. New, new language, like see through the eyes of another, just see through the eyes of, of your CFO um, or, or an investor or, or, a, or a stock market analyst and, and make sure you can understand it's a big part. And then the, the second part is really just to use that knowledge to really specifically motivate the research questions and findings you have. So tie the questions directly to places in the conversion funnel or to um, new opportunities uh, that were revealed because you really understood the competitive report or, or, um, or a new segment that is growing. And you know that because you read that in the shareholder letter, that kind of a thing. Really use it specifically to motivate your work. <clears throat> Love that. Uh, super actionable. And I think uh, it's a great way of framing it, how researchers are learners. You're people who uh, have learned how to learn. So uh, it shouldn't be that much uh, different in a, in a different context. Uh, wonderful. <laughs> so moving on to the next question here. Uh, the second one is the job market for researchers feels very different now than it did a few years ago. Uh, how much do you think this is a blip versus a trend? How should researchers better position themselves in this market? Um, great question. I, I agree. The job market seems much tougher now. I think there are fewer jobs. Um, I think that um, the jobs that are out there, a lot of them have skewed more, more senior. Um, which reflects, I think, fu a fundamental mistake that a lot of executives make um, in assuming that, um, you know, you only need um, highly experienced people to do a research job rather than the full range of people across their careers and the full range of people with their skills. Um, <clears throat> I think the a couple of things you can do to position yourself better right now, um, again, to uh, I'll just reference some so the way I approach writing things on my medium is like um, often I am in these conversations and I get asked a question and and at first I think what what the fuck I don't really know what I'm talking about anyway but sure I'll write about this and so I wrote about um, I wrote a post called um, your portfolio is boring it needs some special sauce and so um, I think the number one thing you can do in any environment but especially in this one is to figure out what your unique angle on being a researcher is. Um, think of the hiring manager that's sifting through probably 100 or, or the sourcer or the recruiter that maybe they're sifting through 100 um, CVs, 100 portfolios this hour. And every one of them is a experienced multi-method empathy first researcher with a deep commitment to high quality products and user perspectives, you know, like, ugh. you know, it's not wrong. It's just boring. So the first thing you can do, I think, to stand out in this environment is to think about what your special sauce is. Check it out. I wrote a post about it in more detail. And then I honestly think uh, the the thing about the thing that I'm saying about focusing on the business can help you. Um, and in one specific way, which is advice I often give to uh, 
job searchers, which is think of yourself as a product person who happens to do research and then pitch yourself as that way. Because I think in a tough economic environment, um, increasingly companies, especially small and medium sized companies, but in, but enterprises too, are looking for people who are less stuck in their lane. They want Swiss army knives, you know, who are people who they believe are going to help them because they have a design sensibility, they can keep a project or a product going. They understand the product development process and will be a part of its success. They aren't just researchers. You're not a researcher. You're somebody who works on a product in a business. And so that's part of why I think the business knowledge can really help us. And as you're looking for a job, just pitching yourself that way. Like, yes, you're an, ex you're an excellent researcher, but the point of that is not just to do research, it's to build a great product and therefore a great business. And so framing it that way when you talk to recruiters and, and, and in your interviews, pitching yourself that way in your portfolio and, and doing it with like a really specific eye to what makes you unique, I think can really help. Awesome. Super, super helpful. Uh, I think that connects similarly to uh, another question that we have here, which is what team do you think research research should sit on at companies? Yeah, <laughs> that's an unanswerable ready. question. Or <laughs> what do you think, Lauren? You know, you're like, why are you laughing? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Oh, you want me to go? No, you, yeah. Have you heard that question yeah. before? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. I think it, yeah, it seems like an age old question. Uh, but yeah, I'd love, yeah. To, love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say something crass about the answer. Like, so it depends is the, is the, um, is the real answer. Like I used to have a stronger opinion about that before I became w way more familiar with how much diversity there is out there in, in companies, in parts of, you know, like you work for a big company like Google, well, research reports into different functions in different places, you know, d depending on the team. Um, and, and so I don't think there's one answer, but I, I do have a kind of a crass answer to that, um, which is uh, research should report into the part of the organization that has the most power. I'm not kidding. And if you're in a company and the question is, should you report to engineering or the CPO, or should you report up to marketing? I'm like, I don't care. You can, we can adapt our practice, right? For what the company needs in this moment. My question is who's going to be your executive advocate? Because the person mm -hmm. who holds the purse strings, the person with um, the voice in in the C-suite room, let's say, or, or, or some level down from that, who's going to be the one banging the drum for you and your work, that's who you want to report to. That person could be in, uh, you know, in uh, food preparation. It doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> like that's who you want to report to. The, exactly. The person who controls the funding, the person who has your back. Um, and I, I hope it doesn't seem, seem crass to you. I just think we shouldn't be precious about it. Let's position ourselves yeah. in the place where we're best positioned for success. 100%. Yeah, that's uh, the insights that you generate uh, need to go directly to the person who's going to make the final decision. And uh, you want to influence their decision, uh, not be four or five, six levels removed where it never makes it there. Exactly. You know, I had a I, I had a conversation recently with some amazing folks who were um, had gotten um, funding to double their headcount. No, f from small to slightly less small, but like, you know, still, you know, 10, 12, 15 people in the end. And like, this is fantastic. Right. And they were and the question we were discussing was like, how should we structure our team? What type of work should we ch do? And I think I I don't know if I surprised them, but the thing I said was, well, who gave you the headcount? And what do they care about? Because if the, doubling your headcount, that's a big deal, right? Like somebody's going to come knocking eventually, wondering what you did with the with two x the headcount. And so the person who advocated for you to get that funding is the person whose priorities you should adopt. What should you work on? I don't know. What's bothering that person today? Well, go work on that immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, and this connects really well also with. Uh, understanding the language of the business, because part of the language of the business is internal politics and how uh, decisions are made and how information flows and aligning research with those systems internally, I think, yeah, super important. Yeah, I, to I totally agree. So I was saying, so I teach in the fall, in each fall, I teach a course at the uh, at UC Berkeley, a graduate course in leadership and management. And the thesis of the course is leadership is a research project. And it basically, we spend a semester going through all the research and examples of how 
It turns out the most successful models of leaders and the research supports this are people who in different ways think of the human, other humans and the social dyna dynamics between them of the people they work with as the subject of their research, right? And then they use that knowledge to be better leaders, right? To adapt their practice, to communicate more effectively, to be influential, to be a better manager, to be inclusive, to drive DEI, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, who's better positioned to do that than researchers? It uses the natural skills we have. The first thing you have to do with a lot of other executives who want to adopt that uh, kind of point of view is teach them about what it is to think and see and feel like a researcher. Well, we don't have to. That's the hardest thing to do. We've got that already. So let's be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. The The foundational skills are, are super powerful. Amazing. Well, let's get back to some of the Q&A. We have a lot here. Uh, so a few questions have come up on uh, democratization, dare I say, the, the buzzword, uh, designers doing research. So uh, I know we've spoken a lot about this within within our space. So maybe share uh, at, a, at a high level what, what your thoughts are on democratization of research itself, insights, uh, driving that to be most effective. Yeah, I think the fear about democratization is not the one most people articulate, which is fear of losing control of the way we generate value, right? A lot of people are worried that if we, if the research doesn't run through me, um, if I am, if I teach everyone to fish, then no one will need me anymore, and and my job is at risk. And I I, I get that, however. Um, I think um, it's like, um, number one, inevitable democratization of research in the sense that um, in the sense that there are now and forever will be tools which allow um, everyone to participate more fully and conduct aspects of research. That is a thing which will never not be true again. And so get on board. Right. Uh, I'm just kind of pragmatic that way. But the other yeah. thing is that. Um, we're talking about raw materials, the production of raw materials, not what you do with them. So I think the reason why I, and this has shifted for me since I wrote the article about it, you know, last May, is I, it, this is why I think the most important thing is uh, deeply integrating researchers end to end in product development processes, because the value that you provide is not mostly or even... It, primarily from your ability to produce primary research materials. It's the, it's the value you provide as an active participant in a decision-making and design process, right? And mm -hmm. so you can't democratize that. And so, the, and so I think I would say, heck yes, democratize away. But those, those, are, those are ways to scale um, the impact of uh, to scale our ability to get feedback and 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 design maybe more effectively and, and efficiently, but you can't scale what we do with those things in the same way. And I think a lot of researchers worry that 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 it'll get away from them. And yes, like oh, that person over there is improperly using a research finding, or or they just relied too heavily on usertesting.com. And I'm like, okay, yeah, but they're gonna yeah. So the way to do that is to create. A structure and a set of relationships which are trusting and influential and put you in a decision making role because you can never outsource that democratization mm -hmm. is here to stay yeah yeah and it sounds like another another thing is separating yourself from that that raw uh, material uh that you mentioned you know separating the uh the researcher from that work uh that other people can also do uh, and realizing what your unique skills are that almost that secret sauce that you mentioned before uh, that you can bring to the table that that nobody else can. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, listen, I mean, I see that. Um, why are we worried about the idea that research would become a commodity? You know, isn't that a good thing? Commodities are just things that are common, you know, that are exchanged in a com in a common place. Right. Research should be commoditized in a certain way or let's say not all aspects of research, because there are things that don't scale. Right. There are types of research which are much easier to um, to democratize or commoditize that way. But I don't know why we're so afraid of that. 
I, I mean, I do. I think it's because we see it as a threat to our identity and our jobs. And I mm -hmm. think given that it's the wave of the future, we, we should take a different approach, which is to embrace it and figure out how to own those raw materials and nonetheless to be the source of insight, even if there are raw materials and, and decision making, insight, decision making, partnership, relationships, even in a world where there are these research insights coming from everywhere. Awesome. Uh, so I think this connects nicely to another question we have here, uh, which is essentially, you know, I think everyone hears you on the uh, embedded piece being embedded in that end-to-end -end process so that you can actually uh, not only actually create the research, but drive those insights and drive the decisions that are being made internally and influence the teams around you. Uh, but all too often, ratios of researchers to product teams are imbalanced. Uh, and someone asked here, how can we be impactful when we are the only researcher uh, and don't have the size of other teams or bandwidth to uh, be in all of these conversations? Yeah, so that's a tough situation to be in. I think I've spoken to so many researchers who are in that spot. They're, maybe they're on an island, maybe they're the only one, or maybe you're being asked to cover like 10 different product areas and you're losing your mind. And um, the, the best advice I can give you um, is to create pain um, by focusing on no more than three things. Like, and those should probably be the top three things, the most important three things, and you should not be the one deciding which are the top three most important things. If you are in that situation, let's say what you should, what I would suggest is find a way to rely on a set of company priorities or your managers or your directors or your executives set of company priorities and say, hey, my full load right now is um, maximum two to three projects. And I'm, I'm choose, I'm, here's my priority. And I prioritize on the basis of this list, which was published by the CEO yesterday. And if you disagree about this priority, I would love to swap something in to the top three, but then I'm going to swap something out because I can only do two or three things well at the same time. I think a lot of researchers have trouble with that because they want to wrap their arms around everybody. And they, they say that they're being asked to cover a whole area. And I think you should confidently state to whomever is asking you to do that, this is a strategy for failure. There is no way to do a good job when I'm, I'm being asked to do research for this entire area or the only one for the whole company or the whole product area for 10 different teams. Instead, here's what I'm gonna tell you is a successful strategy. We're gonna focus on these three things. They're your things, not my things. And then I'm gonna do those. Here's how long it's gonna take. And then we're gonna move on to the next three and we're gonna keep doing that. And if you do that, you find out all those people who wanted your attention that you didn't give them, they see the impact you're having over here. And they're like, wait a second, I want some of that. And you're like, great. And then you ask them to advocate for headcount. I would say when I, I, I grew the, I grew, I've, I've grown teams more like more than I'd like to admit, because I think sometimes growing is not the way out, but my strategy was always, I didn't want to be the one advocating for headcount. I wanted to, I didn't want to create pain, but I wanted the people who felt underserved and saw the impact that was happening over here. I wanted them to go to their bosses. And then for that engineering director to say, listen, I'm willing to convert one of my engineering headcounts into a researcher. That happened to me 20 times. And I would much rather that. And I think you do that by focusing and creating pain. That's amazing. I feel like that's like a golden ticket of advice there uh, that many people uh, may not have heard. And yeah, I think it's important to, to be ruthless uh, sometimes in your priorities. Create and, pain. Yeah, that's what everyone yeah. takes. <laughs> <laughs> Judd says create pain. Judd says create pain, be ruthless. Fantastic. <laughs> Great AMA. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right. So moving on to the next one here uh, from Sam Tucker. Do you think that middle range research is still less valuable in organizations that don't want to iterate? Uh, for example, they want the maximum amount of learning up front before design and development. Um, <clears throat> I think in that type of environment, um, it isn't it we can we can still act, so I can see what you I think your point is super valid. Like we yes, there is a especially when product cycles are longer or in CPG where it's like, listen, like we're not A-B testing every week. Like we got to get this right. Um, 
I still think the average middle range question that we ask or, or that is, or that is told to us or is asked of us to do is, is too blah, you know? And I think we become comfortable with asking questions which are too landscapey and are just like, Hey, like, let's, let's go out there and talk to some hosts on Airbnb and find out what they think about uh, their payment options because that'll influence our product strategy. I'm like, cool, interesting and not wrong, but that could be way more pointed, right? Like that could be way more specific. It could be a specific set of questions which are tied more directly to business pain points or trends that we're partnering with data science folks to uncover or experiments um, that were successful or not. And, you know, I think those things um, uh, are things that are valuable for middle range questions, even in an environment where in a product environment with like longer cycles or where we have to be more sure. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Very helpful. Um, so there's a bunch of questions here as well that I'm picking up on around uh, multi methods. Uh, so everything from qual and quant, but also data science skills uh, that are used at both macro and micro levels. Uh, so I guess, why don't you talk to us a little bit about uh, how you view uh, maybe traditional qualitative researchers being able to transition into multi-method uh, individuals uh, and you know why this is so important in your eyes? Yeah, um, great question. Um, I think the the reason to um, the reason to become more multi-method, there are a bunch of them, but the fundamental one is is that if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail, right? And in and there are only certain types of questions with qu which qualitative methods are well suited to, to address. And if you have a fuller suite of methods, you can combine them in different different ways. So I generally, I used to say that I thought there were five, maybe now five and a half or six tools that, that a really well-rounded researcher needed, probably in a T-shaped fashion, right? So deeper in some than others. And those were um, formative qualitative, evaluative qualitative, uh, survey design, like really solid survey design best practices, basic applied statistics. You do not need to be able to run like complicated multi-level models, but yeah, basic inferential statistics, uh, relational statistics. And then the fifth one is, I would say more, I, more, I used to say that researchers need to be able to run their own SQL queries. And I think that's probably less true now because so much of this is dashboarded and pipelined with, with new tools we've gotten in the last five years. So, but I still think maybe it's instead um, being able to um, really like effectively work with the data infrastructure that your company has, including the people who work with it, but speaking their language. Then that 0.5 or sixth part is AI tools, which of course is like the wave of the future, but you know, being able to use tools in appropriate ways that help you scale your research practice is I think the other thing you need to do. And like, listen, most of us work in industries that in one way or another have global scale or, or geographic scale and or a huge amount of data about customers and potential customers. And if you can't interact with uh, a global audience, let's say via surveys or other feedback mechanisms, and you can't interact with the data that companies ha are awash with in a way that makes it those things part of your research practice, you're, you're, behind, you're behind already. And to me, that's the fundamental argument for, for being more T-shaped. So, you know, listen, like people are like, what should I do if I want to learn? And I like, there are a lot of books. I'm not going to recommend one more than the other. The thing I'm going to recommend to you is YouTube. I'm not kidding. Like go on YouTube. Like my son's 12 and I'm just shocked at the educational stuff he's watching. Like he also watches like stupid, you know, white, we call it white guy screaming as like, you know, dude perfect and whatever. But um YouTube is full of wonderful educational material about all of these methodologies, and it's a great place to start. Mm -hmm. 100%. <clears throat> awesome. Well, uh, we're going to keep jumping around here. We have many more questions than we have minutes left in the AMA. So um, I'll be sure. so we'll need to do. No, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, we, yeah, these are all, all super high impact. Uh, one question that's been getting a little steam and getting some upvotes here is a fun one for you. So what's one way that we can make research less boring? <laughs> Swearing a lot. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> uh, uh, one way that we can make research less boring. Um, uh, okay, uh, I have one way, um, and I do this all the time uh, now, and it's uh, mid-journey. Like, you have the power now for the low, low price of $7 a month or whatever for mid, I forget what I'd pay for mid journey. And there are other competitors to mid journey, of course, but to um, create exactly the, um, exactly the visual aid for your research communication or your, or your, or your report, which is going to convey the thing in, in just the right amount of emotive detail or spiciness. Like you can get a, if you get good at prompt engineering, you know, you can, you can get exactly, exactly what you need. And honestly, like if you're, if you're investing in better research communication and storytelling, which is a thing that can make research much less boring, then you're isolating an insight, one insight per slide with an amazing visual that makes the point and why it matters. Like the, the, what, the, so what, and the, then what, and you illustrated it so perfectly with this crazy little sticker image and like honestly i use like the filter i use the most because you know on on all these tools you tell it the art style you want at the end i say sticker art and that's because the when you when you when you ask it for sticker art they, the images are often bounded in a way that makes it super easy to put them on a background and saves you a bunch of time that's brilliant that's a very nice way of using ai to uh yeah to bring something unique to the table Wonderful. Uh, well, we're going to hop around because uh, the questions are kind of moving in between the different topics. But what is your view on centralized versus embedded researchers? Similar to the question of to whom should we report, there is no one answer to that. Um, I think, uh, but I, I can tell you, I've made in in teams that I've run, I've made both mis going mistakes going too far in either direction. So I think you just need to know the pitfalls of either. Um, I, and to be really brief about it, I think the, in my experience, the pitfall of being too embedded is that everybody gets siloed and researchers are like so deeply with their product team, their designer, their engineer, their, their, um, their product person, and they're filling up their roadmap, but not necessarily with the stuff that's most important. And so people get siloed, they get lonely, they, they lose a community of practice around a, a specific product area, and then they aren't necessarily working on the most important stuff anymore. On the other hand, when everybody is centralized and you're just gigging out, that's terrible too, right? Because you lose the ability to build context on parts of the product. It's way harder to build relationships in that situation and to be trusted when you're like parachuting in like some kind of a, a medic or whatever onto the battlefield. Um, and um, and but on the other hand, you can you can move you can very easily move around to the top priorities. I recently heard um, and it's amazing. So uh, Lenny Ruchitsky has this podcast and uh, um, a recent person who was on it was Elizabeth Stone, the CTO of Net Netflix. I highly recommend it. So she was talking about how, so she used to run before she became CTO. She she used to run the data science and and also the they, they call it consumer insights. The, the terminology is all over the map, but they mean everything under the sun. They mean. People who do media research, content, communication, they also do UX research. They also do more consumer insights and trends and, and landscape marketing stuff. And she was she was talking about how it's a centralized team and why that's beneficial. And I kept thinking to myself, this is great. It only works if you have an engaged and knowledgeable leader like Elizabeth who can actually steer that ship. <laughs> Otherwise, it's centralized teams run into trouble. Um, so there's no yeah. perfect solution. It's just knowing the pros and cons of each is what I think. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, well, this <clears throat> uh, goes into another question here where uh, in a lot of orgs, even ones where research is well positioned, uh, the research function tends to play the role of informing decision making versus being part of the decision making process, uh, which kind of alluded to uh, being, you know, the goal of research is to be super embedded. Uh, and here they continue explaining that a reason is research is being used as one of several key inputs to make a decision alongside business goals, behavioral data, competitive intel, et cetera. Uh, so how can we how can we change that? Um, I think 
Yes, I'm, I'm aware. I think there's a couple things. The first thing is I, I really think we should stop as a field talking about our job as influencing decision makers and decisions. Like that's not what we want to do. We want to be decision makers. And the way we do that, I think is number one, it's like, it's the business language thing. Again, it's like, it's hard. It's really hard to, to, for, for folks to think that you need to be in the room as a decision maker, not just an influencer from the outside. When you, when you're not, when you, when you're just advocating for users, right? That's not our role. Our role should be to be matchmakers, is matchmakers between what the business needs and what users need, right? And so to do that well, we gotta understand both sides of it. The other thing that we need to change that shift, to shift that situation is to spend, honestly, less of our time focusing on primary research and more of our time focusing on relationships. So the most successful researchers and research leaders I've ever seen in that situation, what they do really well is they get next to that person and they really deeply understand their needs and they build a relationship such that they cannot have a decision making meeting, decision making meeting without you. Um, and and you're, when that happens, you're no longer on the outside looking in, trying to be influential. You are in the room being a decision maker, participating with your colleagues. And I think to do that, we have to make these shifts. Like, yes, still user focused, but maybe not, maybe also user centered, just not uniquely user centered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not at all costs, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, okay, a spicy question here that we have uh, from Brad. Uh, where do you think research leadership has failed the most uh, to get the industry to this state? And what do you think they should focus on to fix it? Um, great question. Um, I think I I can, let's see, I can speak for myself and say I've failed over and over and over again for 15 years. Um, I think um, the biggest failure is, the biggest failure I see in research leaders overall is the failure to shift from a focus on research practice to a focus on product leadership. And so what I mean is um, like, I think one thing that made me successful and also a thing that made me, so at Airbnb, I was head, I started as head of research, but I also had a variety of different jobs. I was an interim general manager for a product group. Um, and, and I was um, head of the design studio when I left. So UX design, research, writing, localization reported to me. The way that I got there was by not just being a researcher. It was by realizing that when you are a leader, it actually does a disservice to your team to be primarily talking about research and research practice because there's some, you are the only person as a leader. And I learned this by screwing it up. You are the only person who can form certain relationships. You are only the only person who can convey certain information and translate it effectively. Like you are the only, and, and when, when senior executives or peer executives to a research leader see you not just as a functional leader, but as a partner in building product and business, you earn so much credibility for the rest of the research team that you need to spend more time on that. I think that feels very uncomfortable to many research leaders who want to spend their time building out research ops and like advocating for research communication practices and and like skill frameworks and ladders and and it's not that those things aren't important. It's that there's usually it's not the unique value you can add. And I made those types of mistakes and learned over time that I needed to be focused on different things. And I think many leaders, many research leaders, also make that mistake. Mm -hmm. Super helpful, <clears throat> super helpful. Uh, amazing. So uh, we have, again, lots, lots more questions here. Uh, one, we'll go back into uh, more of the democratization piece, but uh, if companies are building their product orgs with an assumption that designers conduct research, should they not be focusing on micro research? Uh, though, should those designers not be focusing on micro research? Yes, I think that's the the question. I don't know. I mean, I generally think um, I understand the model where designers do research. I I think, um, and, and I think that is particularly common at smaller companies. 
where everybody's got to be a Swiss army knife. Um, I think, you know, I understand why a lot of people who, who do UX design, they understand research as a core part of their practice. That's fantastic. They're usually not as good at it as researchers are because there just aren't enough, there isn't enough time in the day to be good at all of those things. So if you are a designer and you're being asked to do research, you know, doing a type of research, which is really easy to translate to design is probably the best, the best thing for you to do. And usability is, is that it needs to be done. It makes better products. And, um, you know, if you generally have the time and space to do um, different types of research and you have the capabilities to do that, that's fantastic. But like, I understand why those folks are often focused on usability. Sorry, I feel like this is probably not what the question asker wanted to talk about, but I, I'm not sure I, I fully understand. No, I think that was, that was great. Uh, and appreciate the flexibility moving back and forth between topics here. It's one of the one of the fun things about, about the AMAs. Sure. Um, awesome. Different. Yes. Uh, one other question came in just after your uh, previous topic about uh, leadership. Uh, Natasha is asking here, do researchers always have to aspire to influential slash leadership positions? Uh, she also mentions there is something to building good relationships with managers and product leads as well. Oh, for sure. I think there's room for this at every level. Like, I, I, I don't just mean that this is something that you can do only when you're a head of research or when you reach whatever director or executive level or whatever that is in your org. I think it's something that every and, and I that everyone can do, you know, that that um and and I think I've I've seen that before. I've seen the most successful sort of new IC researchers who get really good really quickly at building strong relationships and embedding themselves in product processes and becoming leaders in that way like not just thought of as researchers, but people who are integral to developing a new product line. Like that's something that a brand new researcher can do. And that's something that like the head of research can do. Wonderful. Yeah, can do it at all stages and levels. Perfect. Uh, all right, we're in our last three minutes here. So we have time for maybe one, maybe two more questions. Uh, there were a few questions that came up uh, after uh, you mentioned AI and using Midjourney. So curious to hear uh, if you have any other takes on uh, where people should be focusing as a researcher on AI and what they should be trying to learn and, and upskill within this domain. Yeah, I think um, I think certainly. Um, well, let's see. Number I'd say two things. Number one, I think the hype and the marketing and the sort of the average AI tool company in the research space or elsewhere is saying their technology is probably three to five years ahead of where it is. Like when you actually look at what these things can do today, like it's it's like a, a partial terrible researcher. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I think the thing that AI is best at is probably still summarization. Um, but the problem with that is because of the way the AI tends to work, like you're going to, you're going to, it's not going to, it doesn't replace a researcher. I think the best thing that AI can do is, for example, really quickly help you pull out, let's say from a large corpus of transcripts, um, a series of, of, of verbatims that are around a specific area that'll save you a huge amount of time. But then that AI will probably also like summarize what the key findings from those verbatims. And at that point, I'm like, okay, you you probably found the the obvious stuff, but that's where the researcher brain is something that AI, at least today, can't can't do. So I would say using these tools for for um, think of it as a really amazing uh, on demand research assistant, um, not as a replacement for any of those core research activities. But I also think there's a lot of anxiety that's a little bit that's fueled by this hype and the hype does not match the reality of those products today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, wonderful. Well, we have a minute left. So Judd, any, any last words of wisdom for the audience here? This has been amazing so far. I just appreciate all of you. Like, I know this is a weird moment and like, there's a lot of anxiety and that's why I mentioned the thing about no one has any idea.com because like, it's easy to feel like you're doing it wrong or like there's some uh, message you didn't get or a skill you didn't build. Number one, it's never too late. Number two, when you're in a community of wonderful people like this, there's nothing we can't do. And number three, 
don't be convinced by anybody else's false confidence that they have the path that you don't have. Nobody has a fucking clue what they're doing and we're all just doing our best. So stay humble, keep learning. That's that's all we can do together. And and I'm really optimistic about the future. Wonderful. Well, we feel the optimism and any moment is a good reminder for no one has any idea.com. So I'm going to bookmark it for sure. Maybe even make my homepage because can never be reminded enough. But thank you so much, Judd. This has been incredible. Uh, yeah, just no words. Thank really you for having me. It. I really appreciate the opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Cheers, y'all.